a program. <laughs> Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights, where we do a Halloween movie night and then talk about it two weeks after Halloween. So we started off last time with Green Room. It was a metal ween triple feature. So we had Green Room, which is about a punk band, not a metal band. But they play some metal music in, like, like there's a metal band on after them. We hear some metal throughout the movie. They talk about metal bands. And just the plot is incredibly fucking metal because it's super fucking violent. So, yeah, we'll count it. We'll count it. So Green Room is about... I'm gonna move my desk a little, actually. I have this consistent problem where it's either, like, too far to one side and it's, it doesn't quite touch the edges of the screen. I like it to touch both edges of the screen. Green Room is the story about indie punk band The Ain't Rights, who, uh... They're traveling... They're, they're on tour, but they don't really have a lot of money to... To get around <laughs> um they're, they're like siphoning gas and stuff and they're like uh this is probably gonna have to be our last stop because we're not getting paid but the, they get interviewed by this uh local radio dj and he's like hey listen i i i got a cousin uh, you know outside the city he he can get you a job at this place he knows a place they'll pay you good but the place ends up being a Nazi bar, just a, a white supremacist punk joint, um, which sounds like a real thing. I've never seen or heard of one of those before this movie, but I believe it exists. I'm like, yep, yeah, that's, a, that's a place I believe is real. Uh, so, so they play at this Nazi punk bar, and they're not too happy about it. Uh, so, so they deliberately play, like, anti-Nazi songs. They play Nazi Punk's Fuck Off by the Dead Kennedys, which is a good song. I, this might have been the first time I heard it. Like, the first time I watched this movie might have been the first time I heard that song. It's a good song. I like that song. Heard it just in time, too, because uh, this, this was 2016, so... So after the show... They 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 go back in the dressing room. One of them forgot their phone in the dressing room, so they go back into the dressing room to get it. And the band that's on after them stabbed the girl. Uh, and they walk in on a, a dead girl with a knife in her neck, and they're like, "Oh shit, that's a problem." And the people who run the Nazi bar are like, "Oh shit, you shouldn't have seen that." So basically. They, they they get trapped in this Nazi bar, and the Nazis are trying to, like... The, the Nazis are trying to kill them, I think. Like, there, there's some talk of negotiation, but mostly it's... No, we, we're gonna kill you. To, to, so that you don't spread this around, so that you don't get us in trouble. It's, it's one of the most aggressively realistic films I have ever seen. Because it's you take the setup of, like, Nazi bar trying to cover up a stabbing and just everything that logically would happen in that situation is happening in this movie. This is, this is super realistic as a film. And I, I really love that. And it, it's, it's realistic down to the point that, like, characters will just die. Like, at random points in the movie. Like, most horror films... I almost don't even want to call this a horror film. I suppose it is. I don't know what else I'd classify it as. But it, it's so, like, gritty realism. I'm like, this shouldn't count as horror. This is just a bad time. But, uh... <laughs> like, most horror movies... There's a little build-up to a character's death. Sometimes you can predict, like, oh, a character, th this character's about to die. Not this movie, man. Characters will die in, like, the middle of a sentence, and you're like, oh, fuck! Shit! That dude just died! What the fuck? Like, it, it's so unpredictable whether a character is going to live or die at any moment in the movie. Like, every death, you're like, oh, no, I didn't see that one coming. 
Uh, Pat- Patrick Stewart's in the movie. He's the owner of the Nazi bar, and he, he does a really great job. Um, he said in an interview that, like, after he read the script, he was, like, so scared he locked his doors and, like, hid out. And I'm like, I don't... This, this isn't, like, a scary... I mean, it, it's a scary movie, I guess, but more like... I don't know, more in the sense that it's scary how realistic it is. Like, I'm not worried someone's gonna come get me after watching this movie. I'm like, wow, I I could end up at a Nazi bar and they could just fucking shoot me. That is a realistic thing that could happen. So I, I, I think that might have been something he made up to hype up the movie. Because it's not really that type of movie. It's not really like a, oh, this is super scary. They're going to come for me. They're going to come get me. But uh, No, this is like, wow, it's scary that this totally could happen in real life. This 100% could happen in real life. But I mean, it's really good. It's a really good movie. It's dark. It's a really fucking dark movie. But... It's a really enjoyable movie. I I almost hate to call it fun. Partially because I describe fucking every movie as fun. And it's like, I don't know, man. I just have fun watching movies. I just have fun watching violent movies. It's fun if you like really dark shit. <laughs> if, if, if you're on board for... An aggressively dark movie about Nazis murdering people and and getting murdered in turn. There is plenty of Nazi death in this movie, and that is fun. You can't convince me otherwise. Nazis getting killed is good shit, but uh, it's a very specific brand of fun. It's something I think is fun, but I'm also like, it's a, don't don't take it's fun as like. This is some goofy, silly horror movie. This is a very dark horror movie. It's just fun to watch. This is an A24 production. It's one of the earliest A24 productions, too. This was sort of before they had garnered the reputation they have nowadays. Might have been the first A24 film I watched. Because I did watch the... I didn't watch it in theaters, but I did watch it when it was at the Red Box. So just just after it had been in theaters, I watched this, and I I really enjoyed it, and I I still really enjoyed it on a rewatch, but I I I did see this movie when it came out, around when it came out, and that was before A twenty four was really a big thing. So I'm gonna say this was the first A twenty four film I watched, unless I look it up, look it up, and that's wrong. Pretty sure this is the first one I watched. I did. I didn't know who they were then, they because they, they they've done a lot of great shit since then. So I I think this is a good starting point for them. Like they they kicked off with this one and like, yeah, they've maintained that energy. They've only gotten better from here. Because I I wouldn't. I definitely prefer like Hereditary or Midsommar to this, but it's still a really good movie. This is a really good movie. Um, you don't see it get talked about with the other A24 films as much, too. Maybe people forgot this was an A24 film. (laughs) It's good. It's a really good movie from them, so uh, I highly recommend it. It it also feels very realistic to, like, what it would be like to be in an indie punk band. Like, I... I almost wonder if someone writing on this wasn't themselves part of a band because it it, it seems like this was written from, like, real experiences. At at least the parts with the band at the beginning. Uh, Probably the getting stabbed in a Nazi bar was not real, hopefully. (laughs) I I don't know, maybe they, they were in a band and they had to perform at a Nazi bar and they're like fuck, we're gonna walk in on someone getting stabbed and then they're gonna kill all of us. And that's where they got the idea from the movie. That's what I bet. That's my bet. Directed by Jeremy Solnier. Solnier? Sol... Solnier? I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, 
Jeremy Solnir, uh, who also directed Blue Ruin, which is a brilliant movie. Good, to, be a good thing to pair up with this, you know, Blue Ruin, Green Room, got like a color scheme going on. Brilliant movie. I uh, love Blue Ruin. He also directed a movie called Murder Party, which is very funny. It's a very silly movie. <laughs> that's a that's a good Halloween movie. Two 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 weeks after Halloween here, but uh, Murder Party, great Halloween movie because it's like set on Halloween. It is about Halloween, and it's very funny. M Murder Party would make a great pick for this show. Blue Ruin, I'm not so sure about. Blue Ruin's a little serious. Green Room's also a little serious, but it's violent enough that I think I can get away with showing it on this show. Blue Ruin, it has violent moments, but it's a pretty serious film. I don't know, maybe I will show Blue Ruin. Watch Blue Ruin, it's a good movie. Also, watch Murder Party, it's fun. And also watch Green Room, it's good. Up next, we watched... Richard Stanley's Hardware. So this is a post-apocalyptic movie. Kinda, kinda cyberpunky, but eh, mostly just post-apocalyptic. Some scavenger finds this robot out in the wastelands, and the the main character buys it off of him for like pretty cheap, assuming he can like. Assuming his girlfriend can, like, spruce it up and make it sellable, but his girlfriend starts sprucing it up, and it turns out to be a very deadly killer robot that the government is trying to implement to decrease overpopulation. And so the robot kills a bunch of people. <laughs> it's a killer robot post-apocalyptic movie. Um... The reason this is a Metal Ween pick is because Lemmy Killmeister makes a cameo. Lemmy shows up as, like, a boat operator, uh, and <laughs> they, they get in his boat and he's like, Hey, you heard these guys? And then he starts playing a Motorhead song, and it's like, Lemmy, that's you. That's your band. Why are you... <laughs> I mean, I suppose this is set in... The future, I don't think they say what future year it is. Let me look. I'm pretty sure they don't, they don't say what future year it is, but it's future year, and Lemmy's a boat driver who plays, who, who plays Motorhead for people. It's interesting. It's an interesting film. It's certainly unique. There's a lot of good aesthetics to it. Um... I, I would have liked something maybe a little more action-y. I, I would have liked a little more going on in the film. Because the robot's not doing stuff till, like, well past the halfway mark. So that's probably my main criticism. But otherwise, it's a fun movie. I, I enjoyed it. I don't, I don't regret watching this. Um, it was... The first big movie Richard Stanley made. Richard Stanley became like a minor cult movie director for about five years in the early 90s. And then he got caught up in the absolute travesty that was Island of Dr. Moreau. Which, goddamn, I'm gonna have to do a video on Island of Dr. Moreau. Not, not only does Island of Dr. Moreau have like a crazy fucking story behind its making... I also remember watching it in high school and coming up with so many good zingers. I'm like every fucking line of that movie. I'm like, holy shit, here's a good joke, here's a good joke, here's a good joke. So that's something I'm gonna have to review. I, I have to review Island of Dr. Moreau. That said, it is an unfortunate situation for Richard Stanley because he's like he was trying so hard to get that movie made, and they, they basically just took it from him, and he didn't work in the industry again for years until, like, last year? Maybe 2019, but I'm pretty sure it was last year when he made Color Out of Space, which... 
I really liked Color Out of Space. Color Out of Space was a really good movie. It's It seemed to get pretty mixed reviews. It seemed like a, there were a lot of people that didn't like it, but I enjoyed it. Um, Iggy Pop also makes a cameo in this movie, which is... And it's funny because he got mentioned in Green Room. They mentioned Iggy Pop in Green Room, and then they mentioned Iggy Pop in... Ho- uh, uh, Iggy Pop shows up in Hardware. Um, he did just have a propensity for showing up in things sometimes. Because <laughs> he's in Tank Girl. That's that's what I've seen him in recently. He was in Tank Girl. This is a very Tank Girl-ish movie. Uh... <laughs> I, I could definitely see the two, you know, being on a double bill together. They're both both po- post-apocalyptic, both very punk rock energy, both have Iggy Pop in them. Makes sense to me. This I, I should have had this in the first triple feature. I did Paganini Horror because then it would be three foreign films, but this would have worked so much better because much like Day of the Beast, this is set at Christmas. It's a Christmas movie. Happy Halloween. But also, they talk about (laughs) eating reindeer. They've got fresh reindeer meat in this movie, which ties into Heavy Trip, where they grind up the reindeer meat. You know, so you could have gone from Day of the Beast, which is set at Christmas, to this, which is set at Christmas, and they eat reindeer, to Heavy Trip, which was about grinding reindeer meat. So, yeah, uh, I would have worked better in that triple feature, but I, I decided to make that one all foreign films. Although, this is British. That's a foreign country, right? Britain? Got this, uh, Severin DVD, because the Blu-ray is out of print. I don't know why the Blu-ray is out of print, but the DVD is still in print, but the Blu-ray is out of print, so I had to get the DVD, because there was no other way to watch this movie. Which is kind of unfortunate, because, you know, it's like the the beginning of Richard Kelly's career, like, this has some history to it. I, I think it's weird that it's so hard to get a hold of. And maybe there's, like, a rights battle over it that's what I assume is going on anytime it's really difficult to get a hold of a movie. But I'm, like, just release it, man. Just release the movie. Put the Blu-ray back in print. I would buy a Blu-ray of this over the DVD. It's also the only way to watch the movie, so... If you want to watch the movie, yeah, here's this DVD. Um, yeah, that's hardware. Fun movie. And we finished off with the WNUF Halloween special. Now I know what you're thinking. Matt, is that a metal movie? Not really. It's... There's a commercial in there for, like, uh, metal music, for, like, a metal compilation disc. Um, actually, it's, it's a quite funny commercial because one of the fake bands is named Rotor. And it's like, ah, yes, Rotor references. Um... There's a, there's a commercial for a metal compilation CD, and someone calls into the show and is like, Iron Maiden rules! Woo! So, there's also, like, satanic shit going on, you know? It's, uh, it's about, like, satanic murders. So, the WNUF Halloween special is... A very, very realistic. Like, they put effort into making this seem like an actual news broadcast from the 80s. Um, it's, it's a news broadcast from the 80s. And after the news, this, this reporter is going into this haunted house on Halloween with these, uh, psychics to, like, see if they can contact the ghost of the people that lived there. It's this house where, uh, a guy... Like, he was using a Ouija board, and then he ended up murdering his family, or he, he did, murdering his parents. And people think he got, like, possessed by demons, and that the demons that possess him still live in the house. 
So he, he goes in there with these two psychics and a priest. Um, although we find out later it's not a real priest, but <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, they go in there and weird stuff starts happening. Like the, their recording machine gets smashed and then their cat gets killed and then they start getting killed. And for a while, the film is sort of playing it as like, oh no, the evil demons are back to get us. And then, spoilers? This is a massive, massive spoiler. So, if you don't want to hear the spoiler, skip ahead. This is a good movie, please watch this movie. But I have to talk about this ending because it's such a good ending. It's not the demons. It is nothing supernatural. It's a bunch of Christian protesters who've shown up to, like, kill people on television as, like, uh, ah, this is what you get when you fuck around with, like, devil magic and Halloween is the devil's night, so we're, we're gonna kill you to make a point about how dangerous Satan is. And it's, ah, uh, it's such a good ending. I, <laughs> I really love that ending. Yeah, it's just, it's a really fun, really well-made movie. It, this was made for, like, nothing. They made this movie. Allegedly, the budget is $1,500. I don't think I believe that. If this movie is $1,500, they paid their actors nothing. Right? They j j no money for the actors. I will say, I know some of the commercials they show during this were made by fans, I guess? They were made, people were allowed to send in their own commercials for this, so some of the commercials are, like, fan-made. They didn't direct all of the commercials themselves. Um, and the commercials are really good, really funny commercials. And it's really funny. <laughs> they, there's this, uh, commercial for a carpet place and they play it twice and then like they start playing it a third time and then the the vhs just fast forwards past that and they play it again later like it's th this same fucking carpet commercial keeps playing over and over and over i i could almost see someone complaining about like all the commercials and stuff because the plot is pretty short you could condense this plot down a whole lot, but the the commercials really work as like an aesthetic thing, uh, and and they help the pacing a little bit. I could see someone being upset about how much time is spent on stuff that is not really relevant to the plot, but I think it works. I I appreciate the commercials in this movie. Like like there are moments where like something crazy will happen and the character's like, uh, go to commercial. And it's like, holy shit, the suspense. The suspense. It works. And and the commercials are funny. I enjoy the commercials, so I, I can live with that. <laughs> one of the commercials I want to mention, it's one of the first commercials they show in the movie, but it's for High Pike Pumpkin Garden. High Pike, of course, being the star of hack -a lantern where he plays a guy who owns a pumpkin farm. So it's like, holy shit, this movie just did a hack -a lantern reference. WNUF Halloween special references hack -a lantern 10 out of 10. I love this movie. One of my favorite moments in this movie is like... Because they show us the newscast from before the Halloween special, and then they show us the Halloween special, and at some point in the Halloween special, shit's going down, and uh, the, the producer who's, like, on the scene, like, trying to run the board and everything is like, uh, hey, we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Enjoy this informative news story, and then they just play a story from earlier in the night. And as someone who has worked in live television, that is so fucking accurate. We did that so much. We're just like, oh shit, we gotta fill like a minute of screen time. Uh, 
enjoy this story from earlier. <laughs> that's just, that's something news stations do. That's something you do in live television. That is so beautifully accurate. I love it. Like, I don't know if anyone who worked on this has worked in live television. I presume so, but they they seem to know how live television works. This is yet another one that I watched last October, and I'm like, man, I gotta get a copy of that. And it wasn't out on Blu-ray. It wasn't even out on DVD, I think. I think the DVD is a little out of print. Because this is from 2013, and I don't think it got much distribution back in 2013. Um, but it's it's on Shudder, if you want to watch it. But, but just a few months ago, this got put out by Terror Vision. It is Terror Vision Spine Number 1. Um, they're a partner label with um, Vinegar Syndrome. It's another Vinegar Syndrome partner label. And of course, it comes, it came with, my copy did, because I went ahead and bought the slipcover, because that's the person I am. Came with this super nice slipcover. I love this slipcover so much. I, maybe I'm a sucker, because it's, it's just like, oh yeah, it, it looks like an old school VHS that you would have that, you, you know, you tape stuff on. But I, I love their dedication to it. Like, it's it's got stickers on the front that look like real stickers. <laughs> and because it is a slipcover, because, you know, they've, they've got all the information you typically have to have on the back of your Blu-ray back here. So because that's on the Blu-ray, the slipcover is totally dedicated to just, like what it would actually say on the back of one of these VHSs. This is like, this is not a blurb about the movie or anything. This is, you know, 90 day limited warranty. And like for best results, keep this VHS away from moisture and all that. So it's like very accurate to that type of thing. Cause there, there are other movies that have done like, ooh, look, it's a VHS recording cover. But then on the back they'd have like, a blurb about the movie. This isn't that. This is like complete dedication to the bit. I love it. One of my favorite slipcovers that Vinegar Syndrome has done. There's there's a lot of uh, bonus features on here. They've got they've got some commentaries. They've got commercials that didn't end up in the movie. They've got. There's a couple segments in, like, the news show that get fast-forwarded in the movie. So they've got those in regular speed. There's something on here called the WNUF Christmas Special. I haven't watched it. Very curious what that's about. Uh, another thing I should add about this Blu-ray. The subtitles are stylized to look like television closed captioning. Which is, like, I, I have never seen stylized subtitles before. So, massive props to them for p putting forth... I mean, I'm, I'm sure it was pretty easy to do, but it's like, nah, yeah, you thought ahead and you went, yeah, the subtitles are gonna look like TV closed captioning for this, because it is supposed to be a TV broadcast. So, that's the WNUF Halloween special. I cannot recommend this highly enough. It's very funny... And very charming. Um, it's it's one of those like micro budget films that I'm like, this is how you do it. This is how you make a movie when you don't have any money. This is a good movie made for no money. Like that's 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 without caveats. That's without saying like, oh, it's fun for what it is. Like no, this works. This absolutely nails what it is trying to be. I really like the WNUF Halloween special. This this has been gaining more popularity as of late. I, I mostly saw people talking about it in like horror movie circles and even in like really niche horror movie circles. 
But it's been getting out there. It's been getting some attention. I, I mean, they put it up on Shudder last year, and now it's got this nice Blu-ray release. So, yeah, this this movie is getting attention, and good. It deserves that attention. Um, the directors of this movie have made some other stuff I want to watch. Uh, they made a movie called Witch's Brew about, like, a cursed brewery. And a movie called Call Girl of Cthulhu, which the title alone makes me want to check it out. But they're actually pretty hard to find. So hopefully WNUF Halloween Special gets enough traction that they can get good releases for their other stuff. WNUF Halloween Special, please watch it so that I can see the other stuff the directors have made. I think they're crowdfunding, it's probably like long over by now, but they were crowdfunding another movie, so keep an eye on those people. They, they made a good movie. So last time I asked you what your favorite punk movie is, I would say my favorite punk movie is SLC Punk. I really love SLC Punk. I, I think it really captures, like... Like, it's a very, very accurate look at the punk scene. It's like, this is what the punk scene was all about. Other than that, uh, Green Room, another good one. Also a big fan of Rock and Roll High School. Lino says, favorite punk movie? Repo Man, followed closely by Repo Man. Repo Man's a good movie. I'm definitely gonna have to show Repo Man eventually. Very, very fun movie. Um... Fucking goddamn Elimo Estevez and uh oh fuck who's also in that movie with him? He's a really good actor. I I love the actor who's in that with him. Where are you, Repo Man? I know you're right behind me. There you are. Harry Dean Stanton. Harry Dean Stanton. Repo Man. I've got the nice Criterion Blu-ray which has this fat ass. Liner notes. Like, this is thick. Look at all this. There's like a fucking Repo Man comic in here. This is a good Blu-ray release. Henry Koslick says, Never seen any punk movies, although I did go to a punk convention once, and a guy who was in The Warriors was there signing autograph. So if that counts, I'll say it's my favorite then. I think The Warriors absolutely counts as a punk movie. Um... Very fun movie. I love The Warriors. I'll probably show The Warriors eventually, too. That just... That seems like something I would show. Uh, I love that movie for everything about that slice of New York City that will never get back. A good thing to be sure, but as someone born years after the fact, it's something I've always had a fascination about. Like the greatest city on Earth also being 60% Gotham from DC in some parts. Yeah... Um, I mean, the, the Warriors is not, like, a perfectly accurate look at New York City in that period, because it was sort of, like, like, futuristic, right? It's a little cyberpunky, right? Am I wrong about that? Was that set in the present? Was that set in 1979 when that film came out? I thought it was set in the future. Not the too distant future, but the future nonetheless. Man, I should pair that up with Escape from New York. That'd be a double feature. The Warriors and Escape from New York. And then I'll just have to find some other movie about New York to slide in there. Anyways, tonight my question for you is, who's an actor who mostly did, like, indie cult movies that you think absolutely deserved to be a giant Hollywood star? So, tonight's movies... Every one of them connects to the other two, but there's no cohesive theme to all three. Two of them are a return to franchises we've started, two of them star Bruce Campbell, and two of them are directed by Don Coscarelli. So starting us off, we've got Army of Darkness. We're finally finishing the Evil Dead trilogy. Took me long enough, didn't it? Following that, we've got Don Coscarelli's Bubba Hotep. Starring Bruce Campbell. And finishing off the night, we're gonna return to the Phantasm franchise with Phantasm 2. I'm, I'm sure you couldn't tell I was gonna talk about a Phantasm movie since it's 
noticeably absent from my shelf behind me. That's what we're going to watch tonight. Until the next time, have a nice day.